This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. To start out the program this evening is Lydia Roach. Lydia received a Bachelor of Arts degree in Environmental Chemistry from Columbia University and is currently in her fifth year of graduate study at Scripps, working with the co-advisors Chris Charles and Dan Kayan. For her thesis project, Lydia uses chemistry and geology to examine past climate change in California, the goal being to better predict how California climate will evolve over the 21st century. As part of her thesis project, Lydia has had the opportunity to, to organize and lead several field and marine expeditions, including two trips to the Sierra Nevada mountains where mules were required to haul scientific equipment. Previously, Lydia has supported, been supported by generous donors, including the Wire Family Foundation, and she is currently the recipient of an award from ARCS which stands for Achievement Rewards for College Scientists, San Diego Chapter. And the title of Lydia's presentation is Past, Present, and Future Climate, What We Can Learn from California Mud. Lydia. Thank you. So, as you mentioned, the title of my talk is Past, Present, and Future Climate Change what we can learn from California mud. And I hope by the end of this talk, I will have shown you how we can take mud and learn about how climate change in the past will affect climate change in the present and in the future. So what do we think about when we think of uh, California's climate? Well, the first thing that comes to mind to me is the weather, uh, especially on a day and a weekend like the one we've just experienced where you have these storms coming through. And so this picture in the top left is a, of a wintertime storm coming across Owens Valley in Central California. And then the next thing I think about is agriculture and how climate might affect agriculture because California is such an important agricultural hub. Um, sort of the third thing that comes to my mind is recreation, which is such a big part of the California lifestyle. And this is a picture on the lower left of skiing, and we all love to ski, and so the snow is very important to ski resorts. And finally, I think about how climate will affect policy decisions and infrastructure that is built in California. And so on the lower right, we have a picture of the California aqueduct, which is carrying water from the Sierra Nevada mountains down into Southern California. And one thing that all these pictures have in common is that they all involve water. And I think that water is the most important aspect to consider for California's climate today. And that is what the rest of my talk will focus on. So Southern California is in an interesting situation because it's very po highly populated and very dry. So it has to rely on a number of sor outside sources for fresh water um, to sort of fulfill the fresh water demand of, this, of its populated areas. And one of the most important um, of these sources is snowpack in the Sierra Nevada mountains. And this is a satellite image of um, California. And we can see the Sierra Nevada mountains, the crest of these mountains, is this white stripe that goes from the upper left down to the lower right. And this is taken after a storm has blown through. And so we can see there's a lot of snowfall in these mountains. So not only does this snowpack provide a large uh, volume of water supply, what's the most important about it is it supplies fresh water to Southern California all year round. So precipitation in California falls primarily in the winter in storms, such as the one that we just experienced. And this map overlaid is a map of wintertime precipitation where the blue areas are receiving more precipitation and the yellow and orange areas are receiving less. OK, so here's we see this area of high precipitation over the crest of the Sierra Nevada mountains. And a lot of this precipitation is falling as snow. So this snow, when it melts in the spring and summer after the majority of the precipitation has already blown through California, is carried from the, in the California aqueduct down to Southern California's populated regions, such as Los Angeles and San Diego. Now, how is uh, climate change over the 21st century going to affect this really important source of fresh water? 
Um, as we know from a numerous uh, investigations, uh, human activities and the emission of greenhouse gases will probably lead to climate warming over the next 100 years. And what these warming temperatures might do is, although they might not change the amount of precipitation that falls in California, it might mean that a greater fraction of the precipitation falling in the Sierra Nevada mountains will fall as rain instead of snow. And this will sort of diminish the ability of these mountains to store fresh water year round. And so in a sense, it will diminish these, the snow as a source of fresh water in general. So we can see here, this is 100% of Sierra Nevada snowpack, um, the historical average. And based on a fairly moderate projection of climate warming into the 21st century, we can see that by the end of the 21st century, only 20% of that snowpack remains. And this is just a moderate projection based on um, greenhouse gas emission scenarios. So we need to understand how does climate change affect uh, snowpack in the Sierra Nevada mountains, this very important source of fresh water. So that's where my research comes in. I am a paleoclimatologist, in other words, a climate detective. And like detectives look for clues and fingerprints um, at a crime scene to try to reconstruct the events of a crime, I look for clues and fingerprints um, for past climate change that are stored in the natural world and try to use those clues to reconstruct um, what climate was like in the past. And of course, we have some fancy scientific word for these clues, which are paleoclimate proxies. And you can think of proxies as simply nature's way of reporting past climate change. And an example of a proxy are tree ring, the widths of tree rings. So this is a picture of um, a tree stump. And you can see that every year it's added another ring on. But these rings aren't all the same thickness. And in many regions throughout the western United States, um, the growth of trees is limited by how much water they receive, such that in a dry year they'll only lay down a thin ring, but in a wet year they'll have a thicker ring. So scientists have used the pro this proxy which is sensitive to how wet or dry the climate was um, over the western United States and they've look, compiled a network of tree rings and from this they've learned that during the Middle Ages there were some periods that were very, very dry for a very long time. And they've compiled maps that show where in the western United States were the driest during this period and these are three examples. Now this, this time during the Middle Ages also corresponds to a time that is thought to have been anomalously warm in the northern hemisphere not unlike the warming that's projected into the 21st century. So now we're looking at, okay, it was dry in the western United States during this period that is thought to have been very warm. What does this mean for snowpack in the Sierra Nevada mountains in a warming climate over the next 100 years? And so we need to find a proxy like these tree ring thicknesses that can help us answer this question. And so I look, I'm looking for this proxy and I look in mud, as I mentioned, and we paleoclimatologists like to call it sediment, which is a little bit fancier. And I look um, for it in a lake in the Sierra Nevada mountains. And so like tree rings, mud uh, deposits, the sediment deposits a little bit um, each year. And in some lakes, such as the one that I study, you can actually see the annual layers deposited each year. And this is a picture of the sediment um, that has just been extracted from the lake. And I'll, I'll show you how we do this. And this is just a, a sort of a blown up image of this, of this sediment. So within all this, there, there's a ton of information about past climate change, but can we find a proxy that's particularly sensitive to snowfall, which is what we're interested in? So that's what we're going to look at. But first, I'll give you a little bit of background about my study site. It's in Yosemite National Park, which is this green area here located along the crest of the Sierra Nevada mountains. And here's a picture of the lake. And here's a picture of some brave scientists heading out on their raft um, on their way to attempt to collect some, some sediment from this lake. Now, working in Yosemite National Park is quite remote. Uh, it's, a, it's an official wilderness area, so you, we can't just drive up to the lake with our equipment, you know, get some sediment and drive away. We have to carry all the equipment in um, on our backs, uh, which we're doing here. And this is myself and a, another scientist carrying some of the uh, pieces of the raft. And we have uh, some strong volunteers. I think this cooler weighs about 80 pounds just to give you an idea of, of what people had to carry. And we even had, as uh, was mentioned, we had mules help us out. So it's quite an arduous journey. But we do get out there and we use a variety of techniques to collect the sediment from the lake. And we collect it in the form of sediment cores. And the first way we do it is in, with this frozen core, which is particularly well suited for capturing the most recent or the shallowest sediment, uh, which is very important for us to test our proxy against 
um, climate records over just the past 100 years. The second way we do it um, is called this Livingston core. And it is well suited for capturing much older sediment, although it, it disturbs the, the uppermost sediment. It, it captures sediment. So the bottom of this core is probably about, um, from about 600 AD. So this helps us get deeper material that we can then look at to see what climate was like in the past. And so, so we've collected these cores, but we still need to find this proxy that's going to tell us about, about changes in snowfall. So, so here's a, a high resolution di digital image of one of the cores that we collected. And you can see one thing is that it's quite brown. And this means that it's very rich in organic material. So we're going to look at an organic molecule as our proxy. And this is our molecule. It's a, um, a fatty acid, just like fatty acids that are in our food. And it originates from algae, or otherwise known as aquatic plants, that are living in the surface waters of the lake. And when these algae die, they fall to the, to the bottom of the lake and release these molecules into the sediment. And then this, these molecules are stored in the sediment as it builds up over time. And based on previous observations, we know that certain chemical properties of these molecules are sensitive to hydrologic conditions in the lake surface water. And we think that um, some of these conditions might be related to the amount of snow versus the amount of rain that's sort of feeding the lake water. So we're going to sort of further investigate these chemical properties. So it's, it's sort of a, a pathway from collecting the sediment to actually generating a climate record from this chemical proxy. So here we are out in the lake again. We've just collected a, a frozen sediment core. We get this core back to the lab where we process it. And here I am sort of splitting and sampling a sediment core. We then extract the molecules that we're interested in into um, different fractions. So each of these vials contains a solution with different molecules in it. And this, is the, this fourth and darkest uh, solution contains these lipid molecules that I'm going to analyze. And we analyze them on a big, scary instrument known as a mass spectrometer. And if we're lucky, the mass spectrometer spits out the holy grail, which is data. And so the, this graph is. Um, changes in the chemical properties of that molecule that I showed you. And it's sort of going back in time. So this is the modern day, and this is um, 1900. So that we're looking at the 20th century. And so this is just changes in the chemical properties. And we want to know, do these changes reflect um, changes in the amount of snow versus the amount of rain that fell in the lake? And in order to do that, we compare it with an instrumental record of snowfall in the area. And as it turns out that it's not perfect, but there definitely is a relationship between this blue line, which is um, a record of the snow that fell at, at Beehive Meadows, which is a snow station very close to the lake in Yosemite National Park, and the uh, variability that we're observing in the chemical properties of this, this molecule. So, so far, we're looking at a very um, promising proxy um, that will tell us if there's been more snow or less snow. So on this y-axis, if uh, the, this line is sort of high on the y-axis, that maybe means that there was more snow. And if it's low, that means that there was less snow. So in conclusion, we've demonstrated that this chemical proxy that we've extracted from the sediment actually is sensitive to climate change. And we can therefore go back into deeper sediment um, looking for this molecule to see how it's changed, particularly in the uh, medieval time where we've observed these droughts. And if we find that there was less snow in the Sierra Nevada during the Middle Ages, well, what does that tell us about how the snowpack is going to fare um, in the future, especially over the 21st century? So thank you. And I'd like to acknowledge um, my funding sources, um, ARCS and the Wire Family Fellowship, and also my collaborators in this study, which include, as, as well as Scripps, the National Park Service, um, the Limnological Research Center at the University of Minnesota, and scientists at uh, Caltech. So thank you very much. What forces the coring device down into the sediment of the lake? And um, I can quickly go back to that slide. OK, so the freeze core. It's like this hollow aluminum wedge. And we fill it with dry ice and ethanol. So it's very, very cold. And we literally just like drop it, gravity, just it goes chunk into the sediment. Um, the, the Livingston core is a little bit more difficult. We have to use drive rods to physically push it into the sediment. And then you sort of draw up the sediment into this um, polycarbonate tube using like a piston. So it's kind of like a straw. So yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you know which year is which? 
That's, a, that's another really good question. Um, so on this uh, picture, you can see the, these layers. So one way we do it is we simply just count the layers. We know that this is the top, and so we know that that's 2006, and we can count back. And um, we also know that there was a fire in 1996, which corresponds to this particularly thick layer, so we can sort of count up from that to know that each layer is, in fact, a year. And then as we get deeper down, we use um, a variety of techniques like uh, C14 dating, um, a, as well as the presence of volcanic ash, which can be related to specific volcanic eruptions. So it's sort of like a, a hodgepodge of, of um, techniques that we hope converge on an age. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lydia. Our next speaker is Melania Guerra. Melania is a six-year graduate student working under SIO advisor Erin Thode. She is originally from Costa Rica, where she completed a BS in mechanical engineering in 2001. At SIO, she is studying sound production in gray whales. How to use these calls to passively track their 3D location and how vocal rates are related to absolute numbers of animals present. Early tomorrow, she will be departing for San Ignacio Lagoon once again, where she will be performing her fifth field work season. Her project there has been taken under the umbrella of the Laguna San Ignacio Ecosystem Project in hopes of extending the acoustic time series into a long-term effort. Other seagoing experience includes chasing bowhead whales in Beaufort Sea and sperm whales off Sitka, Alaska. Melanie's graduate work has been supported by several sources, including the Latin American Fellowship Fund. Melania, welcome. <laughs> Thank you for being here. And I wish uh, I could take all of you tomorrow with me down to San Ignacio Lagoon, but this is as close as it gets. Um, and I'm going to be talking to you about how I use passive acoustics to try to count the animals um, and to try to estimate how many there are. Um, and I've learned over the years that the best way to start is with a joke. And um, it helps you be on my side and also helps me relax. Um, but at the same time, it also serves a purpose. And I want to explain uh, the basic of the idea behind passive acoustic monitoring. Um, basically, it's just uh, the study or the science that uses the sounds that the animals are producing to learn about a certain feature of the source. Um, in our case, uh, that feature that we want to study uh, or investigate is the, the number of animals that are present. Um, and that is the holy grail in the, in the study of passive acoustics a lot of times. We want to see if it's possible to estimate how many animals are present just by listening. Um, and of course, uh, knowing how many or how big a population is, is critical for understanding things about the, the population structure, uh, where they are distributed, um, how to uh, strategically manage them, and also what impact they are having on the ecosystem. And in the case of whales, this is very, very difficult, but also critical. As you see over here in the graph, um, whales are submerged over 90% of their time and only exposed uh, a very, uh, very short 10 to 5%. Uh, so it doesn't make sense to use uh, visuals or um, visual censuses for accounting these animals. Um, if we were able to use acoustics, we would have certain challenges. For example, that the processing data set would be very large, um, and you would have to account for certain corrections, uh, like changes in the environment, um, the fact that these animals are exhibiting different behaviors, so they're going to be calling at different rates, and also the fact that there are different individuals, so the fact about demographics. Um, but also, using passive acoustic would be beneficial because it's definitely more cost effective than having observers sitting there for six months or a whole year, um, and it covers a much larger spatial and temporal uh, scale. And finally, it has the potential of being fully automated if you can uh, set up the computer to do the, the work for you. So what do we need to test this hypothesis? We need uh, an independent and consistent visual estimate that is parallel to some acoustic measurements. So the star of the show, the gray whale. Um, a lot of you may be familiar with it because it travels just here in our backyard. 
Um, it comes from, uh, it, it performs a really long migration from Alaska down to Baja. So it travels right by the coast. Um, and some of you may also have seen them down in Baja. Uh, the gray whale is, um, the one that we know is the California stock. And there is also a, a Korean stock, or uh, also co called Western Pacific stock. Um, but that one is very depleted, and their numbers are down to about 300 or 200 animals. Um, the one here, out here in California, is actually very healthy. It has already been taken off the endangered species list, um, and it reached uh, what has been called historical levels. Uh, finally, in um, 2007 and 2008, we have been seeing these whales uh, more skinny than normal. So we are keeping an eye on them uh, just to see what, what happens. And this might be reflecting some issues about climate change as well, because it might, uh, it might indicate that the, their food source in the Arctic is diminishing. In the plot here, you can see a little bit about their migration. They travel south. Um, actually, well, I think this plot is wrong, because on their way up, as they're traveling back north, they hug the coast a lot closer because they're coming with their calves. So they travel from north, uh, their North uh, Pacific um, feeding grounds in the Arctic, and they go down, sorry, and they go down to breed in Baja, and then as they're going back up north, they're coming with their calves. So they are hugging the shore a lot closer on the way north than they, on the way south. So if you want to look out, uh, the best months to do it are between April and June, July, because they're going to be traveling much closer to the coast. So we have found a great platform in San Ignacio Lagoon. San Ignacio Lagoon is one of the three sites where they go to breed. Um, it is located about 500, uh, 600 miles south of San Diego on the Pacific side of Baja California. Um, this lagoon right here is San Ignacio, and also uh, Scammon's Lagoon here on the north side, and Bahia Magdalena on the south of San Ignacio are also pretty well known. Um, but San Ignacio Lagoon has some of the features uh, that have, have attracted us to it. Um, one of them is that there is already a pretty historical record of their visual censuses. Since 1997, uh, researchers at the University of Baja California in La Paz have been counting these whales, and they travel down the lagoon um, through a transect in the middle, uh, through the middle of the lagoon, and have divided the lagoon into three segments. Uh, the superior area, the medium zone, and the inferior zone. So in came the Scripps researchers in 2005 and incorporated acoustics uh, right down here in the mouth of the lagoon. Uh, this is an area that is very um, highly, it has a high um, traffic of animals, more so than the rest of the, of the lagoon. So if you remember the colors, uh, the blue is always going to represent superior, Red is going to represent the medium, and green is going to be the inferior zone. So this is a little bit of the data that I have gotten uh, from the researchers in La Paz. Um, and I'm going to walk you through the plots. The top plot is the data for 2006. And on the bottom, we see the, the data for 2008. Um, along the x-axis, you're going to see time. And on the y-axis, you see the counts, or how many animals were seen. Uh, and again, the color coded is blue for the superior, which has very few whales, then a little bit more in the red one, the medium, and then most, uh, most of them are uh, concentrated in the green or the inferior zone. And then black is going to just be the added sum of all of them. In 2008 and 6, uh, they only had um, counts from the beginning of February until the end of February, so it was a short season. And then in 2006, um, they, as well as us, were able to expand our uh, coverage. Uh, so they started at the end of January all the way through the beginning of April. Um, as you can see, there is a, a pretty uh, striking trend that towards the end of February, there is more animals. And then they start leaving and departing. And towards the beginning of April, they are all gone. Um, I also have to add that over here, I'm counting all adults. So those are, are going to be mothers and also singles. So all the adults are accounted for. So the acoustic effort that we incorporated in 2006, we performed four deployments. And you can see the, the gray shadows overlaying. Um, in 2006, we deployed the instruments. And we had to get them back and recover them and change the battery and change the memory because they were rather small. And in 2008, we had much bigger instruments that we developed ourselves because of the need that we had to. And we could cover four weeks uh, continuous. 
So the acoustic data came from these instruments right here. Uh, these are the small versions used in 2006, and they were deployed in the lagoon over here and here, across the mouth, um, set up on the bottom, attached to a line, and secured to the end with, a, with an anchor. In 2006, we had a buoy, a marker, a surfer's buoy, um, but we lost one of the stations. One of the whales swam by, and its tail got um, stuck in the surface buoy, so for the following year, we learned not to leave any surface marks. <laughs> so this is the deployment in 2008. Much bigger instruments, much bigger memory capacity, much bigger battery capacity. Deployed at the, around the same sites, or actually the same sites, and deployed without the surface mark. So what are we looking for when we finally have the data? Well, these are the very uh, musical, to, me, to my ears, um, S1 gray whale sounds. Um, whales live in a very, high, a very, very noisy environment. And I'm going to play a sound for you, a clip. And you're going to be able to see, uh, hear some of these. Um, they're going to be snapping shrimp, and there's going to be fish, and dolphins, and boats going around. OK, in the background, you can hear a little bit like frying bacon. And that is going to be the snapping shrimp. And snapping shrimp are very interesting. They have a big claw, and they close it and open it really quick. And then there's the whales. That's a dolphin. <laughs> Sounds like a party down there. Um, so these sounds have, uh, for a good reason, been called congas or bongos. Uh, they sound rather metallic. And you could hear, there was a portion there where you could hear several whales calling at the same time. So imagine, um, imagine that you're an acoustician. They actually like to see the sound, not just listen to it. So they have come up with this plot called a spectrogram. And a spectrogram is giving you the information about time in the x-axis, uh, frequency on the y-axis, and then the intensity, or how much energy is there in the, color, um, in the color bar, or the third dimension. So if you remember the pop pops in a spectrogram, they look like very um, fine lines, very short in time, but very broadband in energy and in frequency. <coughs> and these are the one, the, the sounds called S1. Uh, you can find calls that have all the way one from, uh, from one to all the way to 30 pulses in one single call. Um, and they have varying, one of the difficulties is that the intervals between pulses can vary a lot. OK, so what happens when you put the acoustics and the visual together? This is the data from 2006. And I have created uh, something called a histogram. So again, in the, the x-axis, you see time for the whole deployment. And if you remember from 2006, we had four deployments. So you see four separate histograms. And in the y-axis, you see the detections per six hours. So each of the bars is going to be how many calls were detected in six, in six hours. And then the following six hours is the next bar. Uh, so if we put together the, the histograms of the acoustics and the overlaid the line of the census, you see that there is a tendency towards higher uh, call rates at the same time that there are um, more animals present. And I have separated into the inferior zone in green because that is the one that is directly um, affected or measured by the sensors. And then also in black, you see the trend in animal population th uh, throughout the lagoon. For 2008, we also incorporated demographics. So the people that do the, um, the visual counts started separating the counts by demographic. So they were counting differently uh, or, or tallying separately the mothers from the singles. So if you remember the plot again for the visuals in 2008, we're taking this total area of the lagoon in black, and it's going to be this total one here. And we're overlaying also with yellow, which is a little bit hard to see, uh, the singles that are present, and then in purple, the mothers that are present. So if you add up the mothers and the singles, they should come up with a black line. Um, I also took a slightly different approach. Instead of processing all the data like I had done in 2006, uh, clearly, I've only had a year since. Uh, so I decided to take random samples of two hours for each day and see if they would represent what was happening uh, throughout the day. 
So each of the dots is just those representative two hours uh, and how many calls were found there. And it seems like they also show a trend towards higher call rates uh, throughout the month. And the final thing that I did is I also um, listened to see if there were boats present. Because if there are boats, you can imagine it's like having really loud music in a party. So you can't hear your friend because the music is too loud. So if there is a boat, I'm not going to be able to hear the whale that is trying to catch my attention. So you see that in blue are the dots when there was no, pres no, no presence of boats, and in red when there is a boat. And it does affect, um, and you see that the lower numbers, I always get them, or most of the time I get them, when there is a boat masking the sound. And I tend to get more, uh, higher call rates when there is no, bo no boat present. And if I look only at the inferior zone, I also see um, the colors are, again, a little <laughs> difficult to see. But the trend is towards higher call rates towards the middle of uh, February, end of, uh, end of February, uh, matching the presence of um, more animals. So the preliminary conclusion is that vocal rates can represent the trend that is seen visually, both in 2006 and in 2008. However, um, I haven't talked about the really large standard deviations and variances that are present and associated with the results. Um, and some of the uh, reasons could be this ambient noise source of the boats. Um, but also, like I had, had said at the beginning, we have to remember these are not um, mechanical sources. These are animals. And they are exhibiting certain behaviors. And they are going to call accordingly to those behaviors. So we have a new tool to try to answer some of these questions. And that is the, the tag uh, called the bioprobe. So since last year, we have started putting um, tags on these animals. This is the recorder, so it, it, can, um, it can give us um, recordings of the acoustics, so the sounds that the whale is hearing as well as the sounds that the whale is producing. Uh, the pressure, which can be converted to the depth, and also the acceleration in two axes, so how the whale is uh, moving in two dimensions. Uh, they get attached on the whale by suction cups, so these two are suction cups that can just get placed on the blubber. Um, and we were able to place them on the animal and stay for about 10 hours. And this data can give us insight into are the whales um, being impacted by the, the boat? So do they start moving differently than they were moving before the boat arrived by just listening and looking at the exploration data? Um, it can also give us insight into the communications going on between the mother and the calf because they are very close together. And we have found that you can also try to estimate the size of the animal. If you record the blow, you also record uh, harmonics. So how long the vocal tract is gets recorded into those sounds. And that can give you a proxy to the sound of the lungs, and then from there to the size of the animal. So this is one of the tags going on. Uh, the pole is about six feet long. So um, we try to look for a whale that is not affected by our presence, and we just tap it on top, and away it goes. But then sometimes um, the wonder that you feel as a human being takes over, and the science has to take a, a side. So I would like to thank all the, the sources of funding that I have had, and of course, my lab and the lab down at uh, University of Baja California, um, and all the campsites and the people down in Baja that are waiting for me tomorrow. The question is how to retrieve the bioprobe. Um, just like the suction cups on, on your bathroom would fall off eventually, they start breaking the, the seal. Um, they break off, um, and they, um, if I can play the, put the picture again. You can see over here, um, there's a float. The orange part is a float. And maybe you see the antenna sticking out. There is, a, there is a transmitter up there. So whenever it's on the surface, it's going to float upright. And the transmitter is going to give us a signal that we just follow with, a, with an antenna. So I think the question was, how to distinguish individuals? Well, that, that has been one of the major <laughs> sources of um, sleepless nights. Um, and for the most part, we haven't found any uh, distinctive um, things in the call that would tell us which individual it is. So we have had to resort to uh, three-dimensionally tracking and then separating the tracks of the individual whales to be able to see which one is which. Uh, 
Our last but not least presentation is, is by Nick Wagner. Nick is in his fifth year of a marine biology doctorate program at Scripps and is planning to finish very soon in, in June. His research involves various studies on the biology, physiology, and conservation of large open ocean fishes. Specifically, his dissertation focuses on the adaptations acquired by tunas, marlins, and certain sharks for fast, continuous swimming. Nick has received private support from the Nadine A. and Edward M. Carson Scholarship awarded by the Achievement Rewards for College Scientists Los Angeles chapter, the Tuna Industry Endowment Fund, the Edna Bailey Sussman Foundation, William H. and Maddie Wattis Harris Foundation, the Moore Family Foundation, Jeff and Brenda Bone, and the George T. Flegger Foundation. And as an aside, Nick works with this gentleman here in the, in the front row, uh, Jeff Graham. And Nick's presentation is entitled, Mako Sharks on a Treadmill. So as Doug mentioned, the title of my talk tonight is Mako Sharks on a Treadmill. And kind of the inspiration behind the title of this talk comes from a YouTube video. Um, many of you may be actually familiar with this. Um, this uh, work was done by some researchers at Pacific University. And they, took, uh, they, built a, they built a treadmill and took some shrimp and put it on the treadmill and measured different aspects of their uh, ability to run on this treadmill. And this was a huge hit. Somehow this video got leaked, ended up on YouTube, and the people on YouTube took different kinds of music, like the theme music from Rocky and all these different things, <laughs> and had this shrimp running on the treadmill, and it got millions of hits on the internet. And it was so impressive that it actually ended up um, airing on the Today Show. <laughs> and this was actually listed as one of the most memorable episodes of 2008. <laughs> and um, so I thought that was pretty interesting. And actually, the day I was asked to give this talk was the day that this aired on TV. And so I figured, well, if, if this shrimp running on the treadmill can entertain millions of Americans, perhaps talking about Mako sharks on a treadmill could entertain you guys tonight. Um, so I'd like to talk about this, this treadmill that we have here at Scripps. And we're actually, it's a big water tunnel. And you can circulate water through this tunnel. And the mako sharks actually swim against the current. And we can measure many different aspects, aspects of their physiology. And what's very cool about mako sharks, and, and you may ask the question, well, why mako sharks? Why are you putting mako sharks in this swim tunnel? And what's really interesting about makos is that they're very similar to another group of fish that's very, very distantly related. Okay? So if we look at makos, which are a shark, and we look at tunas, which are bony fish, the, the evolutionary lineages of these two groups of fishes have been separated by over 400 million years. Okay? But these fish are remarkably similar in, in a number of aspects of their physiology and morphology. For example, they have a very streamlined body form to move quickly and effectively through the water. They're fast, continuous swimmers. And because they're always swimming, they just hold their mouth open in order to breathe. Okay? So they just go through, the, go through the water and hold their mouth open. And their forward momentum forces water through their mouth and over their gills. And these fish are actually, because they're always continuously swimming, they're actually able to harness the heat that they produce by constantly exercising. And these are the few fish in the ocean that can actually warm up their bodies. Okay? And because they're able to warm up their bodies, because they're always continuously swimming, they have very high oxygen demands. And so looking at these two different groups of fish that are actually very, very distantly related, but yet so similar, they make a good proxy for looking at differences between sharks and bony fishes. And so one of the things that I'm interested in is looking at the differences between uh, the gill design of mako sharks and tunas, okay? And how the differences between the gill design of sharks and bony fishes in general relates. And so just to kind of take you through, if you ever wondered how fish get oxygen out of the water, 
You're going to find out right here, OK? <laughs> this, is, this is very exciting stuff. So in a bony fish, there are gill arches inside the head, OK? And, we, and if I pull out a couple of these gill arches, it looks something like this. And each gill arch has two rows of gill filaments. And on these gill filaments are these very small structures called lamellae. So if anybody ever asks you, how do fish breathe, you can say lamellae. And they're not going to know what you're talking about, but you can say that, OK? And that's really, really fun. Now, if we take a closer look at these gill filaments, here you can see water flows in between the gill, uh, the gill lamellae here. So here's a filament, and here are the individual lamellae. And water flows in between these lamellae, and that's where oxygen is absorbed by blood channels in, these, in the lamellae. Now, if we compare this to a shark, Here's a couple of gill arches taken out of the side of a shark. And here you can see that each shark has two rows of filaments, but these rows of filaments are connected by what's called an inner branchial septum. And this is different from the teleos gill design or the bony fish gill design. Okay? And if we take a, even a closer look, we can see that as water flows in between the lamellae, it actually hits this inner branchial septum. Now, I should take a second to, to tell you that this inner branchial septum actually comes out to the side of the head of the fish. And so when we think about sharks, we think about those gill slits that these sharks have. And this inner branchial septum actually forms that gill slit. So when water flows through here, it actually hits this inner branchial septum. So if we compare that to a bony fish or a tuna, water flowing in between the lamellae, once it flows through the lamellae, it's done with its pathway through the gills. But water flowing through a shark gill goes through the lamellae, hits this inner branchial septum here, and then has to follow what's called a septal channel out along the length of the gill out to the gill slits. Okay? And you may say, well, that's, what's the big deal? Well, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> so we see that they have the same, they have some similarities. They have the same basic respiratory units. They have gill filaments and gill lamellae. But the differences are that these sharks have an inner branchial septum. And the important point that, or the important hypothesis that I've had about this is that this septal channel may actually add resistance to water flow through the gills. Now, adding resistance to water flow through the gills, what does that mean? Well, I like to visualize that by if you're, you know, when you're a kid, you stick your arm out the window, you're driving down the road going like 30 miles an hour, and you stick your arm out there. And you know, you have no problem holding it pretty much straight. But then if you flip your hand like this, all of a sudden you get some extra resistance, some extra pressure, and it pushes your arm back. So the same thing is happening, at least I think, in the shark gill. And so as water hits this interbranchial septum, it's like it's getting pushed back, just as your hand would outside your car window. And so if we take a closer look, um, I, you know, I thought, well, how are we going to measure or how are we going to determine this resistance going through the shark gill to see if it's actually greater than another fish? And so what we did is we, we actually took a mako shark and we wanted to measure different aspects of its gill morphology. And so we took a mako shark, we brought it up to UCSD medical facility, we put it on a stretcher, wheeled it into the MRI facility, and stuck this thing into an MRI. And what we were actually able to do is actually look at very high resolution at the gills, OK? And so if we have water flowing in through the mouth, going over the, here's the gill arch, and here are all the gill filaments. And if we take out a little section of the gill filaments, here are the gill filaments. And I'll kind of show you what the pathway is of water through the gills. So here these arrows indicate water flow. So water flow is flowing over the filaments. It then dives down in between the lamellae here and then into all of these septal channels. And when water flows down through the lamellae, it hits this inner branchial septum and it has to follow this channel out to the side of the head of the fish. Okay? And if we look at this under a microscope, we see the following pathway. We see water flowing over the gill filaments, flowing in between these lamellae, and then out through these septal channels. So I took a bunch of different pictures using a microscope, and I was able to actually measure the distance in between the lamellae, measure the radius or the, 
the, uh, the distance here between the filaments and the radius uh, of this uh, septal channel. Okay? And I took this information and talked to a bunch of people who are experts on microflow. So water flowing through very, very small areas. And I said, how do we determine the resistance of this complicated pathway? And they said, I don't know. <laughs> and so I, des I decided, well, if we can't mathematically determine this, let's actually take mako sharks and put them into a swim tunnel, and we can measure this resistance. So the way this works is we would meet early in the morning. And I've got a number of people that have helped me with this work in, in, in the audience. And, and they can attest to meeting before it gets light out, very early in the morning. We go out on our boat. We go about 10 miles offshore here. And we put a chum bucket into the water. So chum bucket is just, chum is just a bunch of blood and guts of various fish. Okay, And we put that into the water. And then after a while, sharks start to show up. And usually at first, we get something like this. This is a blue shark. Now, blue sharks aren't that interesting because they're not very fast. Okay, They're kind of scavengers. But we're interested in these really, really, sharp, uh, really, really fast sharks, the makos, okay, so we can compare them to tunas. And if we're lucky, we'll get a little mako to show up next to the boat. And once the mako shows up next to the boat, we'll actually throw a couple fish in for the mako to eat. And these guys are like puppy dogs. You, you feed them a fish, and they'll swim around the boat for hours. They just, if they get a free meal, they'll just hang out and kind of look at you waiting for more. And so what we're able to do is actually take pictures of these sharks and, and kind of uh, determine some of their um, s some parameters, like how, how far open their, their, uh, their mouth is. And after we're, we've taken a few pictures, we actually feed a mackerel to the shark um, with a hook in it. And usually, the mako doesn't actually even get hooked. He just holds on to the fish. And you can just pull him right over to the boat. And then we just take a really large net, dip net him, put him into a little transport tank. And then we take, this, uh, take the boat back in about 10 miles. And we have a tank that we can put these sharks into. And then we can get our swim tunnel ready. And so what we do is we can actually put this, uh, put the shark into the swim tunnel here. And if you notice, it's pretty dark here in the background. So we left before dark. We came back after dark. And uh, we usually start these, start these exper experiments many times at 8 or 9 o'clock at the night and then just run them through the entire night. So it's almost a 24-hour system. And we put these sharks here. I actually have this shark in a little harness here. And so the shark can just sit in the swim tunnel and hold his mouth open and just kind of hang out. And then we actually attach a couple pressure transducers. So we attach one pressure transducer to the tongue. And we usually get one of our volunteers to do this. <laughs> and then we attach a second pressure transducer to, um, to the third gill slit. And what we can do is measure the pressure change or measure the resistance through the entire branchial apparatus or through the gills. And what we found, and I'm not going to show a lot of data here, but what we found is that the resistance going through shark gills is much, much greater than the resistance going through tuna gills. Okay? Much, much so. Sharks have much more resistance going through their gills than other fishes. And so the next thing I wanted to know is, well, how does this increase in resistance actually affect the shark's ability to obtain oxygen from the water. And so we would actually let the shark swim around in the tunnel afterwards. I didn't realize there was sound. And so once, they're, once we release them from the harness, they're real excited. And they, they're kind of a little, uh, it takes a little while for them to get used to swimming again. But after a while, we can get them swimming really, really steady. And so we've got this little camera in the uh, swim tunnel here. And what we can do is we can actually get real close to these, to these different gill slits. And I've got a very, very small oxygen sensor. And essentially what I can do is I can put this oxygen sensor right here, right here, right here, all these different locations along the gill arch. 
and we can measure how much oxygen is leaving the gills. So if we know how much oxygen is leaving the gills, we know how much oxygen the shark was able to take out of the water. And so here's a picture of me doing just that. I've got a little, little sensor right here, and I'm sticking it right on the outer edge of the gill. And this is sort of the thing, this is some of the data that we see. So here's for a uh, little mako shark that we ran, uh, ran in the tunnel uh, this past October. And here you can see this is the percentage of oxygen removed from the water. So here you can see really high percentages. So 72 or 70% 70 of the oxygen is being removed. But what's kind of interesting is you see right here, you see a very, very small amount of oxygen is being removed from the water. Only 15, 16%. And I thought, well, what, what's going on there? What, what's the story with that? And when I was thinking about this problem, I remembered a picture that I had taken. So I mentioned that I always try to get pictures of these sharks while they're swimming around the boat. And you can actually, this is, <laughs> the shark got a little close to the camera here. Um, <laughs> he was actually thinking the camera might be uh, a piece of fish. But what, what's interesting about this picture is you can actually see in through the mouth, and then you can see out through one of the gill slits. So where are the gills? What's going on here? Well, the gills are in there, but what's happening is the shark is actually spreading its gills apart. And that's probably a mechanism to alleviate some of this extra pressure. So it's kind of like I'm going through, uh, I'm holding my hand out the window, and I turn it like this, and now all of a sudden I spread out my fingers. Okay, that's essentially what's going on here. And so air can go more readily go in between my fingers, just like here, water can go through these gill slits. And so I mentioned that the shark gill design increases resistance to water flow. And so this seems to be compensated by shunting water around the gills. And well, if you think about that, if you're shunting, water is going in through the mouth and going over the gills, but it's not coming in contact with the respiratory surface, it's not coming in contact with the lamellae, then this decreases the efficiency of the gills. And likewise, what I've been able to do is actually using scanning electron microscopy, using these really high power microscopes, I can go in and I can look at the structure of the lamellae. And actually, the lamellae in shark gills are spaced further apart than they are in other fishes. So this is the same idea. You spread the fingers out a little bit more, OK? And what happens is that decreases resistance going through the gills. Well. We all know that how do fish breathe through their lamellae. And if we, have, if we space those lamellae apart, we have fewer lamellae in the gills. Well, guess what? If we have fewer lamellae in the gills, that means the gills have a smaller surface area. And that potentially, along with this decreased efficiency of the gills, potentially limits the oxygen consumption of sharks in comparison to other fishes. And well, you might say, well, why is that important? Well, in a world that's governed by how much oxygen we can obtain, this is very important. How far you run depends on your ability to get oxygen out of the atmosphere. And the same principle applies with these fish. How fast these sharks can swim is dependent on, amount, on upon the amount of oxygen that they get. How fast animals grow is dependent upon the amount of oxygen that you get. And so theoretically, we've shown here that these that sharks have a slightly reduced capacity than other fishes to uh, pull oxygen out of the water. And so I'd like to uh, thank the following people. Um, there are a lot of people here in the crowd that uh, have helped. You can imagine that going out and catching sharks involves more than just myself. So um, I'd like to thank the following people, especially uh, my advisor, Jeff Graham, who many, of the, many in the room uh, know because he uh, started this uh, lecture series probably about, what, 10 years ago now, Jeff? And, uh, and uh, I'd like to thank the following uh, funding sources who have been really important for uh, allowing me to uh, be here at Scripps. So the question was uh, if having more water, especially excess water that's not being utilized by the gills, if that would increase drag and essentially increase uh, the amount of 
energy required to, for these animals to swim through the water? And the, and the answer would be yes. The question is, what is the benefit of having a less efficient gill system? Less efficient gill system. Well, that's, um, that's a very good question. And the idea behind this is actually sharks have a more primitive gill design than, than more modern fishes. Now sharks, that being said, sharks seem to be getting along just fine. Um, but we, uh, for example, if you look at the differences between um, a tuna and a mako shark, tunas are able to obtain more oxygen out of the water, which means they're able to make more strenuous migrations. So, Large bluefin tuna can migrate from the um, Gulf of Mexico up off the coast of New, uh, Newfoundland in just, in just a matter of a couple of weeks. And so they can really, really power through these really large migrations. And this may limit and prevent mako sharks from, from doing something like that. Now, are mako sharks going to fall off the face of the earth because they have a slightly um, less effective gill design? No. I mean, they're, they're, they're doing quite well. And they do the best with what they can, what they have. Well, that, that concludes the presentations this evening. Uh, why don't we just thank Lydia, Melania, and, and Nick one more time.